you have a Bible this morning, would you open up to the book of 1 Samuel, please? 1 Samuel, and this morning we're going to be finishing off chapter 10 and jumping a little bit into 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel 10 and latter half of chapter 10 and also a little bit of chapter 11 today. I don't know if you've ever picked up a, a book or a watch like a crime drama or something like that on, on television. But there, there's just the well-written ones, the, the well-scripted movies, the well-written books. There's just something really riveting uh, about them, isn't it? You know, the, the way they, they write them, they, they just uh, carefully, so carefully craft them. And, and you, you know, sometimes you're just so into them, it, it's hard to, to really put them down once you start reading. Isn't that true, Judy? Where's Judy? Sometimes it's hard to put them down. And, uh, and, and so, you know, it, they, they start out, and, and oftentimes they'll start out, you know, someone, if, if it's, uh, you know, like a, a crime thing, something happens, maybe someone's been killed, and, and, and you know, you're, you're looking through, and, and you're like, okay, who did this? You know, what, how do we, we know what happened? And, and, and the, the ones that are, are really well done, they, they just don't, you know, they don't just tell you straight out, okay, usually, anyway, it was so-and-so, and, and, you know, they're, they're going to get caught in, in the end. But, but you, they, they set it up so that the whole time you're, you're kind of wondering, like, well, well what's going on? And, and you know, they, they leave sort of subtle little clues as, as to who maybe did it. And, and they, they sort of drop little, uh, you know, little messages and, and hidden things that, that leave you suspecting one person. And then all of a sudden, at another point, something dramatic will happen. You're like, oh, it wasn't them after all. It was... Uh, you know, it's always the best friend that, that does it, even though you don't suspect them at the start. It's always the best friend. And, uh, and, and so, you know, the, the well-written ones, there's just something about them that, that sort of have you on edge. Be, because you're wondering, you know, what's going to happen next? Who did it? How, how are they going to figure out? Are, are they going to get caught? And, and they just leave you sort of question after question after question. And, and so for much of, of a, the movie or, or the book or, or the series... There, there's this tension where things are, are really unresolved as, as to how it's all going to work out in the end. And their point, of course, is, is that they want to leave you uh, coming back to watch the next episode. They, they want to leave you at a, a point where you're going to go out like the next day and, and buy the next book in the series because you just have to know what, what's, what's going on and, and what's, what's happened. And, and that's just the way they do it. And, and if they're good at what they do, uh, they, they get you in, involved emotionally in the story. Now, I, I say that because I want you to think about that. As we were talking and, and thinking through Samuel this morning, and, and, and just sort of thinking through the, the book as a, as a whole, the, the author of Samuel is attempting to do the same types of things. These are skilled authors, skilled writers. He, he's attempting to do the same types of things as he's sort of moving us through the, the storyline of, of 1 Samuel. And, and so it started a, a few chapters back as Israel wants a king. And, and they, in fact, they demanded a king. And, and God warns them through Samuel, a king would not be good for them. But they're, they're saying, well, we want one anyway. And so Samuel uh, anoints a king, as we looked at last week in secret, whose name was Saul. And, and so all of a sudden, the, there's like all these questions that are, are kind of unresolved in the text. The question number one is like, well, how is this whole thing going to work out for Israel? God warned them it wouldn't work out well, but, but is this king going to help them or is it going to hurt them? That's question one. And, and then there's all these other resolve, unresolved questions in the text. Because as we, we look at Saul, Saul is, is a little bit of a mystery to us. And in fact, we don't really know quite what to make of Saul. Because as we, we saw last week, at, at times he was a, a man that was empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And, and yet, at, at other times, there, there's some things going on where we're just not really sure what to think of him. That's intentional. It, it's like he's sort of moving us along, trying to keep us engaged, trying to keep us interesting. And, and there's parts of the story that are not going to be resolved in, until uh, just a few chapters later as we sort of see how it, how it all turns out. So Saul is, is a, a little bit of a, an enigma, no, 
can't even say that word. Never mind. Can I just say mystery? I know what word I mean to say, but I'm not even going to try. I'll just say he's a little bit of a mystery to us. And, and so, you know, it's kind of a way that the author is trying to just keep us interested and engaged in, in, in following the story. Because you're like, I already know how it, it sort of works out. But, but he doesn't let us know that quite yet. And, and so as we're reading part of, of the text, uh, last week we, we saw that Saul was anointed in secret by Samuel. He was going to become the, the next king of Israel. Uh, but Israel doesn't know this yet. And, and so sometime later, we're going to begin in chapter 10 and verse 17. And let's just start reading, uh, reading there. It says, Thereafter Samuel called all the people together to the Lord at Mitzvah. And he said to the sons of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you, Israel, up from Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the power of of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you, but you have today rejected your God, who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses. Yet you have said, No, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. So here's this public gathering where Samuel is going to present the new king or propose new king to Israel. But just before they get into that, there's just, again, sort of this subtle reminder where God says, just before we, we sort of present you with your prospect king, let me just remind you how I've cared for you all these years, time and time and time again. When Pharaoh was coming at you across the other side of the Red Sea, I opened up a way. When, when you had no water in, in the wilderness, I provided water. When you were marching around Jericho, and there's no way that you could have navigated around this, this huge city that was blocking the road, I crumbled the city to the ground. So, so just so that you remember all these things, I've been there for you. I've helped you. I've walked with you. I've, I've found a way for you when there has been no other way. But, but you said, we want a king. So, okay. Here's your king. Thus Samuel brought, this is verse 20, brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the main tribe family was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he could not be found. And so Joshua had done the same similar thing uh, a few times in, in the Old Testament. One time, you may remember, happened at Jericho when they destroyed the city. And, and one man named Achan took some of the, the gold from the city and hid it. And, and they knew somebody had done something and taken something because God was not happy with them. But they're trying to figure out who did it. And, and so they cast lots. And the lots determined that the person that was guilty of the sin was Achan. And, and so when you, you go through the Old Testament, in, in Bible times, Israel understood that the casting of lots was not by chance, that it was not just like, oh, we'll, we'll see, it was not some magical things, but what, what they understood was that God directed the lots. And so not in every instance, not in every case, but in some cases, when you wanted to know what God's will is, or, or in this case, who the king was to be, even though Samuel already knew that, they would cast lots, and God would direct those lots and show the people whom he had chosen. And so first they brought all the tribes, they narrowed it down to the tribe of Benjamin. Then they, they narrowed it down to the family from, from all the tribes. And then from that family, they narrowed it down to one individual named Saul. And so the lot showed that Saul was to be chosen as the next king. And so they're like, congratulations, Saul. Oh, by the way, where is he? Uh, he's gone. He, he can't be found. And, and again, just sort of understand this is part of the un, unresolved points of, or questions of the text. Who is this guy who's supposed to be king? He doesn't even have the courage to, to be in front of all these people. How is he supposed to lead them as a king? So verse 20 um, verse twenty says that, uh, in fact, 21 says that Saul could not be found. And then just look at verse 22. Therefore they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? So Saul even here, and the Lord said, Behold, he is hiding himself by the baggage. And so Saul had kind of taken himself and, and sort of, you know, um, 
went off on the way and, and sort of hid himself and, and hoping that no one would find him. You know, a, a real encouraging uh, act of courage from your future king. And, and maybe, you know, he was just overwhelmed. Maybe there was a sense that he, he realized the responsibility that was being placed on him. But regardless, they find Saul. And the Lord tells him where to find Saul. And look at verse 23. So they ran and they took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upwards. Remember last week we talked a little bit about Saul's good looks and his, his height. And, and again, it's part of, of the sort of questions that ought to be spinning in our head. Uh, there, there's this sense where the, the author is, is trying to, to sort of tell us in a, a subtle sort of way that, that Israel is not focused on the things that Israel should be focused on. Israel is, is not paying attention to the, the qualities of, of someone that, that really would be a good leader for them. But Saul uh, is, is a tall man. In verse 24, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see whom, him whom the Lord has chosen among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. And so now Saul has been publicly proclaimed. Among the nations is the king. Long live the king, they shout. Long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the ordinances of the kingdom, and they wrote them in the book and placed it before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, each to his, uh, his house. And Saul also went to his house at Gibeath, and the valiant men whose hearts God had touched went with him. Just notice verse 27. But certain worthless men said, How can this one deliver us? And they despised him, and they did not bring him any present, but he kept silence. And so here's Saul, and the majority of people say, you know what, Saul would make a great king. Just look at him. We choose him. God has chosen him. We, we sort of affirm that choice. And yet, at the same time, there's this group of people that are questioning already, before Saul's even done a single thing, saying, you know, how can this guy lead our nation? And, and so there's sort of, he has this opposition, and, and they did not bring him a customary gift, they did not have a show of support, they did not uh, proclaim him as their king, as their leader, they just sort of grumbled off on the side, and, and Saul just kept quiet about it. Saul didn't bring it up, Saul didn't mention it, although people would have seen and noticed, Saul just let it be. Now here's something that you ought to know that's sort of interesting about this passage, is even though it says that Saul is king and Saul has been made king and, and all these things, Saul has not actually been made king yet. He's just given the opportunity to audition for the job, um, if, uh, if we could say that. Maybe you've been one of those places before where you've been for a job interview and you're like, oh, I got hired. And they're like, oh, we're just going to see how you work out. And after two weeks, if you don't work out very well, you're not. That essentially is, is Saul's place. He's been given the opportunity to show the nation that he can be a king, that he can lead them, that he can take them out into battle, but yet that has not been shown or proven yet. But he won't have to wait very long, because in the very next chapter, Saul gets an opportunity, Saul gets a chance to show the people of Israel that he is the man for the job. And let's just read a couple of verses here. At the beginning of chapter 11. Now Naash the Ammonite came up and besieged uh, Jabesh Gilead. And the men of Jabesh said to Naash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve you. But Naash the Ammonite said to them, I will make it with you on this condition, that I will gouge out the right eye of every one of you. Uh, thus I will make it a reproach of Israel. So there's this bad guy. And his name is Naash. And, and he comes down from the mountains, comes down from the hills, uh, surrounds a city that belongs to Israel, and, and essentially cuts them off from all help. There's no time for reinforcements to get there. There's no time for them to, to call for the, their neighbors or other tribes to say, come and help us. And, and so they're, they're stuck. Nothing they can do. And they say to, to Naash, they say, make a covenant with us. And in other words, Let's deal with this peacefully. You got us. Okay, we're not escaping here. You could just come in here and destroy us. But, but you know, unless we all die and you lose a few good people, let's make a covenant, an agreement. Let's make a sort of a, a surrender here. 
And, uh, and Nia says, yeah, I, I can do that. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. And, and he says, here's my terms. I will take out, I will take out from each of you an eye. I will gouge out your right eye of every one of you. That's my terms of surrender. So you might lose an eye, but you'll get to live, essentially. Now, there's a, a couple reasons that Nash would do this. The first is because it sends a message. Nash is not just gunning for this city. He's coming for, like, a lot more cities. And so, all of a sudden, uh, this sort of sets him out to be somebody that is feared, somebody that, that you, you need to be aware of, somebody that, that you know, you, you shiver at when you hear the thought that he's coming for you. Also... Uh, when, when you take out the right eye of, of the people uh, for future use and, and for future moments, their, their military capability is d diminished uh, severely. It's a lot harder to fight with one eye than two eyes. And so essentially he's saying, you know what, uh, not only will this send a message to everyone else, but you, you're not going to be a problem for me in the future because you try to raise up and, and rebel against me. Uh, that, that's going to be hard for you to do. Now... If you're, if you're losing me here, okay, if you're like, oh, this is really boring, um, this part is really funny, okay, so just, just hang in there. Now follow this along. This is his proposal. And in verse 3, this is what it says. The elders of Jabesh said to him, let us alone, or leave us alone for seven days that we may send messengers throughout the territory of Israel, if there be... Uh, then, if there is no one to deliver us, we will come out to you. Now, do, you do you guys understand how funny that is? Their proposal, their counter-proposal to, to, to Naash is simply this. We, we want you to let us send seven messengers or a bunch of messengers to all of our neighbors, all of our people, and see if we can raise up an army to fight against you. See if we can raise up enough people to, to you know, actually have a, a fighting chance. And, and if you let us do that, and, and let it be for seven days, at the end of seven days, if nobody's going to come and help us, then we will submit to your terms. Now, this is the funny part. This is the funny part. Okay? It says in verse 4, Then the messengers came to Gibeath of Saul and spoke these words in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voice and wept. No. That's not so funny. But do you understand what happens here? Naash says, yes. Like, why would he do that? They say, you know, let, give us a chance to sort of gather our forces. You know, let the people through the lines. Let, send them, let us send them out all through Israel. And, and you know, Naash says, you know what? Sure, why not? And, and so I don't know what was going on in his mind. Like whether he thought nobody would come and help him, whether he was just so uh, confident in his abilities that he just didn't care, and, and he was going to you know, take them and take anyone else that wanted to come and help them, but he let, allows them to send the messengers out and see if anybody would come and help them. And uh, they get to the place, the hometown of Saul, and when the, the people in Saul's hometown receive the message and hear what's happening, they leave. They, they are devastated. They are sad, of course, what is going on. Now behold, this is verse 5, Saul was coming from the field. So at this point, Saul is still working on his farm behind the oxen. And he said, what is the matter with the people that they weep? So they uh, related to him the words of the men of uh, Jabesh. And then the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily. So notice that God is involved. God is just here. Spirit comes upon Saul. When he heard about these words, and he became very angry. He took the yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them through the territory of Israel by the hand of the messenger, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to this oxen. Then the dread fell on the people, and they came out as one man, so as one, one group, and united. And he numbered them at Bezek. And the sons of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah, 30,000. And so Saul hears about all this, and here he is, a farmer, looking for a chance to prove his worth, looking for a chance to prove to the people that, that he can lead them. This is about three months after his, his sort of public um, you know, pr pronunciation where they said, you know, he is the king, and, and now he has his chance. 
And so he, he chops up some oxen, which is really gross and, and probably to you really weird. And he sends them a bunch of different places to all the corners of, of the tribes. And he says to the people, he says to them, if you do not come and fight, if you do not help your neighbors, uh, he says, let it be that happens to you as has happened to this oxen. And what happened to the oxen was not good. In, in other words, uh, in, in a sort of a, a sneaky kind of way, he, he's challenging and, and yet intimidating the people. And he says, you come and you fight and we will go and we will help the people of this city. And so the response is overwhelming. And the tribes gather together and they raise an army of about 330,000 people and they march and they go and, and they defeat uh, the king, uh, the Amorite king Naash, and they deliver the city of Jabesh Gilead uh, from Naash and, and his army. And so Saul has a chance. And Saul, in, under, I think, the, the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon him, brings the people together as a nation. And, and you know, everything they wanted from a king, and in so many ways, he, he calls them together, and they respond quickly and efficiently and effectively and go out and defeat their enemies. Because after all, isn't that what a king is supposed to do? Isn't that what a king is there for? Isn't that why you appoint a man uh, is like Saul to lead your nation when your nation needs him? So that is the story how Saul became king. And yet there's still, I think, just a couple unresolved questions. And I think one of the big questions that's unresolved, big questions that the, the text is asking us to consider is, is simply this. Who is king of Israel? Who do the people follow? Who do the people look to? Who do the, the people trust in? Who do the people uh, believe in or go to when they need help? And, and the, the answer is, is, I think you know, the answer to that question should be God. The answer should be the God who, who led them across the desert. The God who opened the sea. The God who crumbled cities. The God who, who defeated armies when they were outnumbered uh, ten times the amount of people that they had. That is who they should trust in. That is who they should put their faith in. And yes, at different times, God did raise up human leaders uh, to, to help them, to lead them, to guide them. People like Moses, people like Joshua. And now the question is being asked, who do the people trust in? Are they going to trust in God? Or are they going to trust in their true king? Or are they going to place their trust in their faith and their hope in King Saul? The, the one that leads them out, the one that goes before them, the one that can call the people together, the one that summons them uh, from the, every tribe and in every place and can raise up an army to help them defeat their enemies. That's the question that Israel needs to answer. Now, of course, David, the, the king who would follow King Saul, led armies. David uh, helped people. David, uh, you know, went out to battle his, his enemies. David called for members of the tribes to come and, and fight. David did all these things. But I, I want you, if, if you would, just turn uh, to Psalm chapter 121 for a moment. And I just want you to see David's perspective. I mean, David did what was required of him as a king and what was expected of him as a king. But, but just see here. Um, David's perspective in, in all of this. And, and you'll, you'll see in, in Psalm 121 that David sort of gives us his, his insight as, as to what happens when he leads God's people. And, and just, uh, just see here in, in Psalm 121. Now if you, you have a heading, some of you may have headings above your psalm. It sort of gives a little bit of a, a title as to what the psalm is about. This, this psalm, the heading for me says, The Lord, the Keeper of Israel. The Lord, the Keeper of Israel. And in Psalm chapter 121, there's a song that is written about this. It says this, very first verse, says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where shall my help come from? When I am in need of rescue, when I am in need of help, when my enemies are surrounding me, when, when they're standing on the high mountain 
looking down upon me. Uh, where does my help come from? Israel, where does your help come from? Do you call upon King Saul? Do you call upon King David? David responds with this. He says, my help comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He says, he will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. In other words, you can't catch God in an off day. You can't catch God and say, well, sorry, I wasn't around to give you a hand there. God is, is always watching. God is always there to help. He who keeps you uh, will not or, or does not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. This is a message to Israel. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. In, in other words, the Lord is the one that sort of covers you and, and protects you. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. See, David has a very clear answer to who is the true king. To who is the true one that is leading? To who is the true one that, that goes out to battle, goes out to war for Israel? David's answer is, it is the Lord. And, and yes, I put up the call for troops. And yes, I, I financially, as, as taxes come in, support and, and upkeep an army and, and make sure that they're well trained. But the, the truth be told, when it all comes down to it, it is God that fights for us. Not him. Not King Saul. Not any other king, for the Lord is the true king of Israel. He is the true king whom at this point in Samuel chapter 10 and the first part of Samuel chapter 11, the people have rejected and said, you know what, we really don't want you. We really want someone else that we can physically see and sort of, you know, sort of a figurehead for us. Where does our help come from? Where does our strength come from? When we feel surrounded, when we feel overwhelmed, who is it that we look to for strength, for hope, for guidance, for rescue? Is it the Lord? Yeah. Is it the, the one who watches over us? The one who does not sleep? The one who does not slumber? The, the one who watches every movement and, and, and makes sure, make sure that we do not slip, that we do not fall? Is He our help? Or do we place our trust in someone else or something else? Something else maybe that we can see. Something else that's maybe a little more predictable, that, that we know how it works, that we understand the ways in, in which they work, where it works. Money, power, we go to those who have the most power, the most influence. Israel needs to know, needs to learn, needs to remember. That their hope is not in King Saul, but that their hope is in King Jesus. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, what a wonderful set of, of verses there in Psalm 121. Just a reminder that our true help, our source of strength, the one who, who fights our, our true enemy, our true battles, is the Lord. And yes, you call people like Saul and David and others to lead your people and even lead them into battle against their enemies. But Lord, you have not called Israel or us to place our faith, our belief, our, our belief, our hope, our trust in them. We know that David reflects his trust in you and in Saul. That will be worked out in the next few chapters of the book of Samuel. Lord, we are thankful for today. We are thankful for your people, Lord, and the things that we struggle with this week. The situations that are unexpected. Lord, may we just re be reminded, may we just remember, Lord, your strength, your hope, your help. We pray these things in your name. Amen.